Thank you to Reza and the Scaled ML team for putting on another virtual edition of the excellent Scaled ML series. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about something that's been popular with the press recently, which is whether we can now stretch what we know about artificial neural networks to achieve brain scale AI. Superhuman is a threshold of utility for many practical and valuable AI tasks. For example, would you take advice from an artificial doctor if it was less well informed than a human doctor? Uh, similarly, a safe car driver, whether it's artificial or human, needs to understand how humans behave and how humans think. This is probably harder than understanding vehicle dynamics or mapping the road. Now there are some tasks, of course, specialist tasks, that an AI could presumably do without requiring all of the information of human scale brains. Um, however, I'm going to ignore those and just assume that scale is, is, refers to parameterization and that by brain scale, we mean the same sort of parameterization scale as a human brain. So what is the information scale of a brain? Well, we know we have roughly 100 trillion to 1,000 trillion trainable synaptic weights in our brain. Uh, probably they're highly redundant. Certainly they can sustain damage uh, and recover. Um, we also know from very excellent recent work that the synapses in the hippocampus, at least, have a resolution of about four and a half bits. Uh, in other words, they can resolve 20-something different levels of connection. Um, now, the convolutional reuse of parameters that is uh, a characteristic of all deep neural networks should mean that deep neural networks have greater parametric efficiency than brains. Uh, in other words, the deep neural networks can reuse the parameters usefully um, in a convolutional manner, and brains can't. Um, however, we'll ignore that, and we will say that, uh, approximately speaking, an adult human has perhaps 100 terabytes of brain state, in other words, learned information, and we will look at DNNs that have a comparable amount of weight state. Alongside the information scale of a brain, we might consider its computational scale. The amount of compute done by our brains is actually unknown, even approximately. But one thing we do know is that we do not fire every neuron or use every synaptic weight in response to every stimulus that we encounter. This is something that deep neural networks, or most deep neural networks, do. Uh, GPT-3 is a good example. Uh, every input or output datum interacts with every parameter in the model. Uh, now, it's probably obvious that an efficient AI capable of multiple tasks should not need to do that. Uh, or if it's responsive to more than one type of data, it should not need to do that. An AI, like a normal brain, should be able to steer information to where it is most usefully processed. And therefore, it should be reasonable that an artificial brain scale machine should only have to process a subset of its learned data in response to any datum. We call this characteristic selectivity. It is often referred to as conditional sparsity, uh, call it what you will. Uh, and by selectivity, we mean the fraction of the total weights used to evaluate one datum. And usually this is dynamically chosen according to the data. Now, because of this selectivity property, the computation scale, in other words, the number of parameters used to compute a datum, can be very much less than the parameter scale, in other words, the total number of parameters of an AI, just as it is in a brain. We'll come back to this. Let's look at training a large neural network of the style that we have today. Let's say 100 trillion weights, so that it is brain scale, and let's say 100,000 iterations of first order stochastic gradient descent, uh, which is typical of what is necessary to train a large neural network. 
If we assume from the excellent work done by the OpenAI team and others, that the training data needs to scale roughly as the 0.4th power of the number of parameters, uh, and if we take the number of training data used for GPT-3 as a reference, then we will need about 4 trillion data to train our 100 trillion parameter model. If the model is dense, then every parameter will interact with every datum. This sort of training will require 3,200 yottaflops. A yottaflop is 10 to the 24 floating point operations. And that would take about 800,000 years on one of today's chips, typically sustaining 125 teraflops per second. That's about half of the peak performance of today's chips and typifies what they can sustain on language models. The cost of that today on Amazon, if you reserved Amazon instances of the right type for, long, for the maximum period, would be about $11 billion. Um, <laughs> fortunately, the batch size is very large, 40 million data, so there is plenty of opportunity to reuse fetched parameters. So the upshot of this is that compute is very, very expensive, infeasibly so. Now, will we be able to improve chips over the coming years to fix this problem? The answer is no. Moore's law is come categorically over. Um, and speed today is limited uh, as much by power as by the number of transistors that we can integrate for a unit cost. Uh, this graph shows, in fact, the three phases of scaling of chips. The first phase uh, was actually what is now popularly known as Moore's Law, roughly a doubling of performance capability every two years. But you can see that a second phase has taken place in a power-limited era since 2005, and we are now entering a third phase in which the improved performance per watt from a fixed area of silicon, in other words, from a fixed maximum size die, is only going to improve by perhaps 5% per annum. This means that we're stuck with an energy cost per flop of one to two picojoules. That's for flops using small 16-bit operands for the foreseeable future. A computer of 200,000 chips in the future, each capable of something like four times today's performance, in other words, 500 teraflops per second, coupled to a one or 200 megawatt power station necessary to supply such performance, could deliver that 3,200 yottaflop target number for our 100 trillion parameter dense model in one year. But I conjecture that that would be too expensive for anyone to actually try. So training at brain scale will require selectivity. Uh, I think there is no question about that, uh, practically speaking. Foreseeable advances in silicon will not enable first-order stochastic gradient descent training of dense neural networks of brain scale in reasonable time or reasonable cost. Um, the dense training at this scale is completely limited by compute, uh, and compute is limited by energy per flop. Voila. If convergence can be achieved with fewer iterations, perhaps 10,000 SGD iterations, and if we can harness selectivity at a scale of, say, 1 in 1,000, then we can bring down the training cost of that enormous 100 trillion parameter model to about the same as today's GPT-3, which is about 300 zettaflops. This is not cheap, but it is possible because it has been done. So we have established that the training of brain scale dense neural networks is compute limited, not bandwidth limited, and not limited by the capacity of memory required to hold the model. However, one cannot ignore bandwidth. The structure here has been proposed by one AI vendor as a solution to the training of 100 trillion parameter brain scale AI models. In this structure, all of the model state is placed in one box, and that box is connected by a distribution network uh, 
to a large amount of compute. In the box is up to 2.4 petabytes of state, certainly sufficient for 100 trillion parameters and the corresponding optimizers. And the I.O. to the box is 1.2 terabits per second. Unfortunately, this means it will take four and a half hours to read or write the contents of the box and 100,000 iterations of stochastic gradient descent would therefore take 50 years. However much compute machinery you attach on the right hand side and whatever the selectivity of the model. Uh, it doesn't depend on selectivity because the training even of selective models still requires that all weights experience the same number of SGD iterations. So this scheme is not a good idea. It would be a better idea to distribute all of the weight state across all of the arithmetic machinery. Here are two memory schema for the next generation of heavy AI chips, data center AI chips. On the left is the evolution of today's HBM type GPU, uh, in which HBM3 emerges with uh, six stacks of 24 gigabyte uh, memory uh, devices. These are each capable of uh, enough bandwidth to provide 4,000 gigabytes per second of sustained real usable bandwidth to the processor. Uh, and this gives us a computational intensity of 63 flops per byte. In other words, if we have at least 63 flops for each byte fetched, then we are compute limited and not bandwidth limited. And that is, at an example, 250 teraflops per second. Now, in order to hold 100 terabytes of, sorry, 100 trillion weights, which is 200 terabytes of weight state, we need 1,389 of those types of devices. On the right is an alternative using a much denser memory type, commodity server class DDR. Uh, in the near future, DDR5 will be the standard. Uh, this allows up to about 12 DDR DIMMs to be attached to a processor. The recent AMD processors are an example of that. Uh, and that supplies up to about 3 terabytes to one processor at 500 gigabytes per second of real sustainable bandwidth. This therefore has a computational intensity requirement that is higher than the HBM type, it's about 500 flops per byte at 250 teraflops per second. Now because the capacity is higher, we only need 66 of this type of device to hold our 200 terabyte weight state for our 100 trillion parameter model. So let's look at two types of inference uh, using these types of chips. <clears throat> First of all, consider a specialized uh, AI for document classification. It absorbs documents and it produces a classification token or some tokens describing what's in the document for indexing. Let's assume a dense language model with 100 trillion weights as before and let us assume that future chips can actually sustain 500 teraflops per second. Now if the query document is typically a thousand tokens then single shot classification requires 200 petaflops for each of those. Uh, and we have to read 200 terabytes of weights for each batch of those, not for each sample, but for each batch. The computational intensity is 1,000 flops per byte. Uh, so inference is compute limited for either of those memory schema. Uh, in other words, we don't need to use batching in order to synthetically increase computational intensity. It's already compute limited, not bandwidth limited. In this scenario, the 66 DDR5 type chips are attractive because we can fit our whole model in, in, those, in that number of chips um, and we can process a query in six seconds. If we use the HBM3 type chips, we would need 1,389 of them and it would have no performance upside. Let's dwell for a moment on how much uh, advice from an AI costs. In other words, when your AI is doing inference, how cheap does it need to be? Well, speech dialogue with a human 
uh, is typically conducted at about 125 words per minute. So if a human expert charges $375 per hour and spends half his time listening and half his time talking, um, then the cost of that advice will be about 10 cents per word, which is about 7.5 cents per token. If 100 trillion parameters are used in the production of an output token from an AI expert, then cost parity with the human expert requires a performance of about 2.7 petaflops per dollar. So will we get that? Uh, a chip with a total cost of ownership of $1,000 a month, which is typical of today's cloud AI accelerators, but a future one sustaining four times today's performance at about 500 teraflops per second, will deliver about 1.3 exaflops per dollar. In other words, about 500 times cheaper than a human expert. So compute bound inference can certainly be cheap, even for enormous brain scale networks. Let's talk about a different type of inference with a brain scale AI. In this case, uh, conversational inference in which the AI must pr generate um, a sequence of tokens rather than one shot inference. Humans can actually read faster than they can speak, uh, but for complex material, we tend to sub vocalize, so the speed tends to fall to roughly speech rate. So consider a token wise auto regressive text generating AI with 100 trillion weights, with selectivity 1 in 1000, which is generating tokens at about three tokens per second for each of several parallel conversations it is having with humans. This will keep up with the human's ability to read the response. Now there may be an initial context to each of these conversations and processing that context may be compute limited. However, once generation has begun, we will clearly be bandwidth limited in this scenario. Uh, for a model of this size, uh, generating three tokens per second, we require about 600 gigaflops per second and 600 gigabytes of weight fetches per second. Now the parallel conversations may be batched to improve computation rate, but unfortunately with selective access to the model state, each conversation may select different parts of the model. So in this scenario, batching does not generally improve the reuse of fetched parameters. In other words, we're stuck with this unfortunate computational intensity of one flop per byte for this type of inference. That favours a machine with maximum bandwidth, in this case the HBM3 type chip, because it has more band bandwidth. But of course, we still require a very large number of those chips in order to host the very large model, because the high bandwidth memory has relatively low capacity. So the HBM3 type chip is probably preferable, provided the work can be efficiently parallelized over 1,389 chips required for the 200 terabyte capacity. The DDR5 chip would only require 66 chips for capacity, but it does not have as much aggregate bandwidth. Nevertheless, it could sustain 55 parallel conversations at this rate, if the latency permitted. So the message here really is when designing algorithms, there are certain things which are clearly hardware unfriendly. <laughs> Token-wise autoregressive inference implies a computational intensity of one flop per byte fetched from memory. This is maximally unfriendly to high performance computers because it's much easier to provide flops than it is to provide bytes per second to a large memory. And unfortunately, it's going to get worse than that because with high selectivity, it is generally not improvable by batching, even if the latency permits, because each parallel conversation in the batch may select different model state, and therefore batching does not improve reuse of fetched parameters. So that's all I have to say. Let me leave you with a few thoughts about where we are leading in the future. First of all, I hope I've illuminated that AIs, like humans, 
are pretty ruinous to educate, <laughs> but having educated them, they are surprisingly cheap to operate. So it may well be worth spending a good, good deal of money on educating large, very useful AIs. Secondly, energy per flop of silicon is a wall. It's not moving anywhere in the near future. Moore's law will not come to the rescue of high performance AI compute. A lot of improvement has come from architecture recently. I expect that to continue. I'm sure we'll learn how to get AIs to operate well with single byte parameters and single byte data. Um, however, sooner or later that will run out of steam and the underlying silicon is not moving. Selective sparse evaluation will be essential at brain scale. Not optional, essential. So we have to harness that technique and great work has been done recently with sparsely gated mixture of experts, for example, in the uh, G-shard and uh, switch transformer work uh, and, and many others. Uh, finally, um, algorithms bend to the available hardware. Uh, this has been referred to as the hardware lottery. Um, but we are lucky right now because a lot of companies are building novel hardware. In other words, a hardware diversity experiment is currently in play. If you are an algorithm designer, then now is your chance to discover what is possible and for once, perhaps, bend the hardware to the algorithms. Ultimately, I am sure that we will need more than one shape of AI computer because the utility of AI is so broad and so great that I'm sure it will warrant multiple types of hardware. Thank you.